Hello everybody and welcome to Lex's Lounge. So today is a very special hangout where we're going to be talking about coronavirus stats and I'm hopefully going to help you guys put this whole corona thing back into context because I've been quite frustrated by some of the, shall we say, borderline criminally irresponsible media headlines uh, that have come out as a result of corona over the past few weeks with certain media outlets being worse offenders than others. <coughs> CNN. Anyway, to begin setting the context, let's talk about the flu of 1918. This was a serious virus, an H1N1 strain actually, that infected half a billion people on the planet. That was a third of the Earth's population at the time, and worldwide it killed 20 to 50 million people back then. That estimate may even be on the low end. In the United States, it killed 675,000 Americans at a time when there were only 103 million of them, resulting in a death per capita rate of 6,553 deaths per million. That's quite a bit. Bear in mind that nowadays one of the leading causes of death annually is heart disease and stroke, which combined take up about 2,100 lives per million every single year. And I assure you that they did practice social distancing during the 1918 flu. Within weeks of the first cases in the United States, all churches and schools were shut down, all public gatherings were banned, and governments all over the place were launching campaigns against sneezing and coughing in public and going out when it wasn't necessary. Now even casual observers already know that CV isn't anywhere near as fatal as the virus of the 1918 influenza. Or even a few more recent outbreaks that have stayed more localized. But how does something like CV rank against annual killers that we're more familiar with, like seasonal flu, suicide, motor vehicle deaths, or diabetes deaths, and can we already estimate that today based on the international data? Data we have rolling in. It matters a lot because countries all over the planet are shutting down their societies and unemploying millions of vulnerable service sector employees for weeks or possibly longer in order to flatten the curve of this thing. For me personally, as a guy who's more of a stock trader, doing this analysis was essential in gauging the severity of corona way back in the second week of March, long before any of the epidemiologists and health ministers started to publicly revise downward their worst case scenarios every day. This analysis gave me a jump on most people and gave me the confidence to make certain investing decisions at the absolute peak of the market panic, right when fear was at its highest. I didn't even have to be a mathematician or own a modeling program to figure this out. So let me show you guys how I could see it. Okay, so the site you see before you is worldometers.info slash coronavirus. This has been a site collecting all of the data from all of the countries for all of your cases and deaths and so on and so forth. And it's been invaluable as a resource. I'll link to it down in the video description, of course. Although you may have seen uh, snippets from this website pop up on your social media feed lately. And when you first open it up, you see three figures. The coronavirus cases around the world, that's actually the tested and confirmed cases only. The deaths around the world, currently at 30,300 worldwide. And the current confirmed recoveries, again, that's only of the ones tested, which stands at 139,000. You can scroll right past this, past these scary looking non-logarithmic charts, though you can change it up here to logarithmic, and you can go down to this table. This is the meat and potatoes of the data that we're looking for. It updates daily and it pretty much gives us uh, all the stats for all the countries around the world. You can learn a great deal from this table thus far if you organize it correctly. First, let me show you how to organize it incorrectly, and evidently this is how a lot of reporters seem to do it. They go into this page and they organize it by total cases. And right now, by total cases, the 
the United States appears to be the worst country hit by the coronavirus. In fact, the total case numbers are deeply problematic. They are more a reflection of how many tests a country has available and what is their policy as far as testing. Certain countries like Germany have tested a lot of people, even people who are showing mild symptoms or are young or don't require hospitalization. As a result, you see that Germany has 56,000 cases Oh, but look, only 400 deaths thus far. That's a lot lower than some of the other countries with high case counts. So you can see right there how the number of people tested really messes around with the case count. So the very first thing you learn about analyzing corona stats is that cases are useless. I could go on for half an hour about how flawed cases are as a metric. So what is useful? Well, total deaths are useful. So let's organize this chart by total deaths. Okay, here we are. We organized it by total deaths. And by total deaths, it appears that Italy, which was hit at the end of January, is the worst country hit on the planet at 10,023 deaths. And they also have a fairly high total case count, despite the fact that they don't have nearly the resources to test everybody. What are the actual case counts, by the way? They might be 10 or even 20 or even 50 times higher than the official tested statistics. But back to deaths again. So looking at this, it looks like Italy is the worst hit by deaths, Spain is second, and China is third. Now you're starting to get a little bit of data, except it's still not adjusted by capita. For that, you need to go a little over to the right and look at deaths per one million. And here you're starting to really learn something about the coronavirus. In fact, let's organize this by deaths per one million. Now here you have to actually discount a few really, really small countries where for various complex reasons uh, their deaths per one million are really skewed because they don't even have one million people. So if you discount them, you still have Italy and Spain near the top. The reason they're at the top is because they have respectively 166 deaths per million in Italy thus far and 124 deaths per million uh, in Spain. By comparison, the United States with all of its cases is still at only six deaths per million, pretty much at the bottom of the chart right here on the screen. This figure is incredibly important because even though it's partial and only uh, relevant for the time being, let me give you guys a few pieces of context. In the United States, every single year, there's 48,000 suicides on average. That's 146 deaths per million. In Canada, there's, uh, for diabetes deaths, there's 188 per million diabetes deaths. We already said for heart and stroke in the United States, it's 2,100 per million. Motor vehicle crash deaths in the United States, 100 to 110 per million, depending on the year. And of course, seasonal flu, 153 deaths per million on average annually in the United States. That seasonal flu figure, by the way, of 150 deaths per million, roughly speaking, is actually pretty flat across the entire world, so it's a good guideline. So at the moment, versus the seasonal flu, there's only a single country on the entire planet that can be genuinely said to have been hit by corona harder than the seasonal flu hits it every year. And that's Italy, because they're at 166, which is higher than 150. Now, right here, the most common criticism is, well, Lex, you don't know when this is going to end. How long are these figures going to keep on rising? Well, a few weeks ago, I really didn't know when this was going to end. But nowadays, we have a whole bunch of various indicators. Uh, let's first look at our indicator of China and South Korea. These are both countries that got hit very early and actually managed to beat Corona. Where's China on this list? Well, if we have it organized by deaths per 1 million, they ended way down here. Two deaths per million. 81,000 cases, 3,300 deaths, 
but that's only two per million across China. And if you look at their total case stats, their daily new case stats, and their active cases, you can see that China has flatlined and there's virtually no possibility of a second wave or anything of the sort. You can do a similar thing if you go to South Korea, where's because a lot of people criticize China. They say, well, China could be making anything up. Who knows about China? All right, let's use South Korea. They were hit very early as well in the middle of January. They ended up with 9,500 cases, 144 deaths. And as you can see by their total case count, their daily new cases, and of course, their active cases, they are well over their peaks. The total deaths are still rising, but as you can see, there hasn't been a meaningful increase in daily deaths in about a month. So they have pretty much flatlined. Now, those were two examples of two countries that really locked down hard. What about countries that didn't lock down quite as hard, such as maybe uh, Taiwan or Singapore, where schools remained open, but certain day-to-day -day life did change in significant ways and almost everybody was uh, wearing masks. Well, Taiwan doesn't give us detailed stats, but they got hit quite early on January 20th. They are currently at 283 total tested cases, but more importantly, they're at a grand total of two deaths. And uh, yeah, I know even though I don't have charts on this site, that they've pretty much slowed down to a crawl. Meanwhile, where's uh, Singapore? That was another hit early country. They are at 0 0.3 deaths per 1 million, a grand total of two deaths, and a grand total of 800 tested cases. And again, they didn't lock down. They simply kind of changed certain things. Like if you go to school, they make you like disinfect at the door and they make all kids wear masks or most kids anyway are wearing masks in the footage. So they, they didn't shut down their society. Meanwhile, we have other countries where we may not get data for a while, but I'm very interested in seeing what happens, such as Brazil. Where's Brazil on this list? There they are. They are currently at 3,500 tested cases, 93 deaths, and 0 0.4 deaths per 1 million. And Brazil got hit fairly late, around February 24th, so they're about a month behind some of these other countries. Now, the reason why I find Brazil so interesting, not simply because they're still on the rise, but because their president has pretty much told them, ignore this thing. Live your life as if it's normal. This is basically a severe flu and don't worry about anything. Some of the governors disagree with him, but basically that's what's going on in Brazil. And Brazil is a big populous country. So if social distancing does in fact work, if that is what's making uh, coronavirus so underwhelming, I would expect that Brazil over the next few weeks and maybe month and a half starts to get hit pretty hard. Or they don't get hit hard and this is all a mass hysteria. Guess we'll see. But you guys can see what I'm driving at here. When you do the math in a unfeeling, unsentimental way and do a little bit of contextualizing against other things, you realize that whether you are locking down society full blown or not locking it down, this just isn't that scary of a virus. And I suspect that when this thing is all over in a few weeks and people return to their senses, there's going to be some very, very difficult questions that are going to be asked about how this was handled, the type of spending that took place by governments while it was being handled, and whether it was all really a good policy or bad policy. I think in probably a few weeks I'm going to make a video uh, to let you guys know how that's turning out. On that note, if this was useful to you, this time I'm hoping you actually share it rather than just like and subscribe so that more people can learn to read the Corona stats a little bit more critically. On that note, we'll see you all next time.